Let's do another Q&A. This time our question is, do I have to go to Wednesday night Bible class? Do I have to go to Wednesday night Bible class? I don't think this question is ever going to stop being asked, and there's a reason for that that I'll, I'll get to as we move forward. But I want to begin answering this question by just making some fundamental points, three fundamental points, and then I'll get to what I believe the correct answer to this question is, how to handle this question at the end of our study. So let's get these fundamental points in first. Number one, simply being in attendance does little good on any day, whether you're talking about Sunday or Wednesday or any other day for that matter. Uh, assembling with brethren is not a sacrament. And what I mean by that is that grace is not received just because you happen to be physically present in a building with other people professing to be believers in Jesus Christ. When the Bible talks about assembling, it means meeting with other Christians in Hebrews 10 chapter 25 that we're going to look verse 25 that we're going to look at here in just a moment. But it applies to any and all opportunities to study and worship, not just in a formal setting or, quote, going to church, as we tend to think of it, but really any opportunity that's afforded to us, we, as Christians, should want to take it advantage of. When we see that we can study or worship or work with our brethren to further the Lord's cause, that should already be of interest to us. And assembling, being and meeting, being with our brethren and meeting together with our brother, brethren for the purpose of worship and edifying one another, this is only part of really holding fast to the confession of our faith. And so I want to go to Hebrews chapter 10, and let's just read verses 19 through 25 together. I'm going to put it on the screen here. So this is Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. There's a typo at the bottom that says verse 15, but it should be 25. Therefore, my brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way open for us through the curtain of his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold resolutely to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And let us not neglect, neglect meeting together, as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So verses 24 and 25, we often single out, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but so long as we remember that they are part of this larger context here, wherein we see that this is, the, the writer is talking about drawing near to God in doing this. So that's his point here. We have these great blessings that we're in, through that have been afforded to us through Jesus offering his body. He's made this available to us. And now our responsibility is, and the privilege that we have, is to draw near to God with this full assurance of faith. Because we are blameless and clean before him. He's getting rid of our guilt and shame. We have a pure conscience now. So we can and should hold resolutely to the hope that we profess to have. And part and parcel of doing that is stirring one another up to love and good deeds and meeting together. Not just for the sake of meeting together or because meeting together and doing that we're somehow pushing a magic button and God's grace is given to us. No, we, we should be motivated to do this because we understand it's part of holding fast our hope, drawing near to God in, in faith. Right? So it's not that we're just not going to church or to Bible class. It's that we're refusing actually to do these things here when we refuse and willingly neglect to meet with our brethren to worship God together and to edify one another. And notice the Hebrew writer says you should do this all the more as you see the day approaching. The day of his return, I believe, is what is meant there. And so this is not just uh, something that we're just trying to tick the box on. We can't think of the assembly or meeting with, a, with our brethren in, in that way. Uh, we can't let ourselves reason in this, in this way. So what's the difference here between, if we're talking about Wednesday night or Sunday night, is there a difference? The Bible teaches us, fundamental point number two, the Bible teaches us to observe the Lord's Memorial Supper and to give of our means on the first day of the week. And the passages which teach us that are Acts chapter 20, verses 6 and 7, 
in 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. In Acts 20, Paul is in Troas and he waits a number of days so that he can assemble with those brethren on the first day of the week. And when they do, they break bread. And in the New Testament, that is a phrase that indicates, depending on the context, it indicates uh, observing the Lord's Supper, as I believe it does in Acts chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul instructs the church there. He says, Just as I told the churches, the local churches in Galatia, so I also want you to do that when you come together on the first day of the week, each one is to set aside a little money and lay by in, in store so that no collections need to be made whenever I come. And so he was talking about specifically the collection for needy saints in Jerusalem. But those passages present to us a pattern for us as God's people. Though Those Christians were approved in what they did, and so we should be concerned with that and want to follow that approved example that we find in these passages. Uh, but if we find ourselves thinking along these lines that... Uh, because I assembled on the Lord's day, well, then I don't have to do it on any other day unless I just want to. This is a red flag, and it should be a cause for concern. Because what we are effectively saying, what we really, what we really mean is, I've counted my beads for the week. Don't ask any more of me. I've, in other words, I've ticked the box. I've pushed the button. I've met the quota, and so I'm done. And this is a red flag because it betrays a misunderstanding of what worship really is. So yes, there's significance given to the first day of the week, and there are certain things that God has authorized for his people to do as a local church on the first day of the week, and only on the first day of the week. But that doesn't mean, just because I've done those things, that I'm somehow, uh, I've met the bar, and now I'm released from any other responsibility of assembling any other day of the week. That betrays, again, a, a misunderstanding of what the assembling, the purpose of assembling is, and I think also what worship is. Worship begins in the heart, number one, and if there is no reverence for love or love for God to begin with in your heart, then nothing you do is acceptable. Nothing you do is acceptable, including worship, including going to the assembly with to be with your brethren and worship with them. If you're not doing it out of love and reverence for God, then nothing, then it's not going to be acceptable. Worship begins with an attitude. And one cannot acceptably worship anywhere without a sincere desire and effort to serve God everywhere. Your faith cannot be compartmentalized, as we sometimes say. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Verses 23 and 24, he says, If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your, leave your gift there before the altar. And first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You see, faith in Christ affects every aspect of our life. And what Jesus is saying here, if there's something amiss in your life, and you're just coming to the altar and acting like it's okay, that's wrong. Because here, in this specific example what uh, someone had against them because of their sin affected their worship. And so they couldn't acceptably worship God there at the altar, or we might say, for our application, in the assembly, corporately with, with our brethren, because we haven't had a sense that we haven't applied his truth to every aspect of our life. Or not, we're not sincerely desiring to do that, to serve God everywhere. And so... If we can't accept, acceptably, we cannot acceptably worship God anywhere without a sincere desire to effort, an effort to serve God everywhere in every aspect of our life. Fundamental point number three: Wednesday night cannot be profaned. Wednesday night cannot be profaned, but God's word can be. Here's what I mean by that: If the leadership of a local church sets aside time on Wednesday night. Or any other night for or day or time for that matter, uh, they have not made it a holy day. Okay, they haven't put it on the same plane as the day that the Lord authorized for His people to assemble and to worship and do those things that we talked about earlier. Uh, elders don't make divine law; um, they guide and they direct and watch over a flock in their locale. Uh, they shepherd God's people where they are as they themselves try to follow 
divine law. But if in their determination to follow God's divine law and to feed the flock and to watch over them, they have set aside time on a Wednesday night or Thursday or Monday, whatever the case may be, or, or multiple days of the week during the week, we should not ignore that direction. If there's no violation of conscience toward God in, in, involved, whether we're talking about meeting times or any or anything else, any other matter of judgment, um, we cannot afford to ignore their direction. Because if we do, what that means is that we're just unwilling to work with our brethren. And we are in violation of Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, where Paul says, do nothing, do nothing out of uh, selfish ambition or conceit, but uh, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, so that, uh, not looking to your own interest, verse 4, uh, but each of you to the interest of others. And so we can see why this is serious, I hope, at, at, at this point. That willingly refusing to assemble with brethren and participate in corporate worship on any day is serious because of what it says about my attitude toward God and His will. It's not serious because uh, I've desecrated Wednesday night or some other day, uh, but it reflects, you know, my approach to this in my whether I'm I'm refusing or or if I'm doing and giving my very best effort to be with my brethren. Uh, when they are assembled, that says something about my attitude toward God and the things of God and His will and what He has called me to be and do. And when brethren desire the sincere milk of the Word and that they love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and they're seeking His kingdom first, they're going to welcome each opportunity to associate with other people who are of the same faith, who, are of the same, who have the same like precious faith, and who are striving to do the very same thing. And they're going to do all possible to worship and glorify God together. I'm going to put a few verses on the screen here as we conclude our study. And I'm going to end uh, our, our, our study with by asking another question in response to this question. And I think, you know, I said at the beginning, this question is not going to go in any way, away anytime soon because I think that there will always be folks who uh, either don't understand and or don't appreciate the purpose of God's people meeting together. And so I want to end with these three verses, and then I want to ask a question. So 1 Peter 2, 2, I've alluded to all of these. Crave pure spiritual milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And in Matthew six thirty three, he says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So let me ask this question. If I am honestly striving to follow these teachings, am I more likely to look for every opportunity to assemble with people who are also striving to meet these teachings, or am I more likely to ask, do I have to? You have to answer that question for yourself, and so do I, and I believe you'll come to the right conclusion. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope to see you soon.